Hello and welcome to Pioneers in Medicine. I'm Bruce Gewertz, Surgeon in Chief and Vice Dean for Academic Affairs here at Cedar Sinai. And it's our great good fortune today to have my friend Randy Sherman, who's our distinguished chair and uh, Chief of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at Cedar Sinai. Uh, welcome, Randy. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Well, listen, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where you grew up, and how you ended up being a doctor. Well, I'm uh, from the wilds of the Midwest, grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I was committed at an early age to be a fighter pilot in the Marine Corps, but obviously that didn't work out fortuitously, probably because of football injuries and the like uh, that led to several operations during the times I was supposed to be diligently uh, in basic training. But during some of those football incursions uh, and those injuries, I met a wonderful mentor named Bernie Jaffe, who was in his residency at uh, Washington University. And he curiously um, uh, moonlighted as our high school football team doctor. And after sewing me up in, uh, uh, in several different anatomic locations, which he didn't have, obviously didn't have cer certification in, I've got the scores to, to show it. Um, he really uh, helped guide the way to help me understand the beauty and the intrigue of, of surgery. Uh, working at the gas stations at night, uh, he would call and uh, have me come down and shadow him during an emergency laparotomy. Um, and I think it was the drama and the intrigue of, uh, of such a, uh, a life-affirming, yeah, it was really the life-affirming uh, act of intervention that was so utterly dramatic uh, not really the intellectual aspects or the professional aspects, but uh, really that, that very raw uh, event of, of, of interacting with someone uh, to really change something about that person's life that was really laid bare in the operating room. And I think that through whatever I went through in the next several years, that it, I was brought back to that that event or those events and so that that's really what played uh, a very important role in in uh, my start and and i think along the way there were a few very key personalities as there are for so many of us uh, who served uh, to embody the 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 style and the and the commitment and the wit and the charm and the dedication really transcendently identifying all the great things you wanted to be, you know, and the plastic surgeon that really did it for me had all those things, plus he was handsome, and of course I was going for that one, but never quite got there. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's what started it, yeah. It's such a small world, of course. Bernie he was a, a legend in academic uh, surgery and was a, uh, was a terrific friend to me on occasion, and I've really enjoyed uh, seeing him when he comes out here to visit you, and he's a he's a fine person, and and that only uh, restates his uh, his contribution to education, which has been fairly consistent over fifty or sixty years. So Remarkable. much to be admired. Remarkable. So, how did you get interested in plastic and reconstructive surgery? Uh, it was uh, like so many things; it was a bit of a fluke. Uh, I had uh, I was late to the game in signing up for my senior electives, uh, and of course, you know, most people chose uh, general surgery or orthopedic surgery uh, for those last uh, four weeks as a senior. And and uh, by the time I got to the list, it was uh, maxed out. So, plastic surgery was available. I didn't really know much about it. And there was a, uh, a young uh, attending named Lynn Puckett who had recently come over from Duke to my uh, college, my medical school. And uh, he really just was the cat's meow when it came to uh, elegance in the operating room, elegance of thought, elegance of mechanics, of strategy, of tactics. I mean, he really put it all together and I just thought, I want to be that guy. Um, 
there were so many parts of so many people that I appreciated as I went through medical school, but he really delivered uh, all of those things that I held dear um, in one individual. So he just so happened to be a plastic surgeon. So that's what I was going to be. Well, one of the fantastic things about your career has been a uh, two things, I think. One has been a, a laser-like focus on education. And I know your involvement in education of residents during your period of time as chief at USC and your service on the American Board of Surgery where we first met, uh, but also the inventive way that you've looked at tissue transfer and microvascular and astomoses to replace uh, function and, and, uh, and structure of different organs. Uh, why don't we start talking uh, about microvascular? Uh, because that's such a fascinating field. And if you could share in your mind how you think about that as you reconstruct uh, parts of people's bodies, uh, how, how do you think about uh, moving tissue uh, in, in different areas? Well, I think there's a there's a great building block to appreciate what it takes to put things back together that have been broken. Uh, first is to understand that our version of electricity, as you know so well as a vascular surgeon, is blood flow. And I, I'm impressed, as I think you have been in the past, with sometimes those few sayings that get the point across and are lasting. And my first transplant uh, professor uh, summed it up very well when he said, when you're hot, you're hot, and when you're not, you're dead. And by that, he meant that blood flow was the cornerstone of everything. Everything that functions in the body uh, has good blood, flow, good blood flow, excellent blood flow, uh, and things that uh, go bad, whether it's heart, viscera, your brain, uh, your limbs, uh, really are broken irreparably because of lack of blood flow or dysvascularity. So the importance of, of, of blood flow as the, as the cornerstone to whatever it is we do uh, really stands at the, at, 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 at the crossroads of what I believe is most important about whatever it is I do. Um, and so mastering the techniques to uh, ensure good blood flow in the constructs that we build was critical to me and of course I, I learned from so many great technicians along the way including Harry Bunke and Chen Chong Wei in China, um, uh, many like him, Fu Chan Wei in Taiwan, um, the brilliance of uh, mastering small vessel anastomoses. Now what does that mean? I mean you know blood flow subtends a particular entity in the body. It can be an organ so when we're transplanting hearts or livers or lungs, we have to hook up the things that are important that those machines do. In the lungs, it might be the breathing tubes, but of course, we've, you know, most importantly is we have to reestablish blood supply. And, and the same thing goes when we are transferring one, one's own tissue to another part of their body. And this all started, um, I think, eminently and obviously when someone accidentally lost lost a piece of themselves most notably a finger a part of a hand or a hand and then to restore that uh, piece of anatomy to its rightful place the mechanics had to be worked out i.e. sewing tendons together mending the bones um, approximating the nerves but of course, to make it all work, blood supply was the key. So understanding the nuances of how to regain blood supply to those particular structures and, uh, and doing that year in and year out at a very large county hospital where I created a replantation service really helped me to refine the basic techniques, uh, the fundamentals of, of reconstructive surgery. From there, taking people who didn't have the good fortune of presenting immediately and having the part to put back onto 
the amputated limb, we then had to get creative and start to understand how we might replace a lost digit with something else in the body that might replicate that. So thus began the era, the, 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 the era of toe transfers where we might take a, a, a great toe and make a thumb or multiple small toes to make fingers. Um, from there we went to more broad uh, interpretations of, of donor sites to recipient sites, taking a fibula bone, which is the smaller component of the lower leg bones, finding its blood supply and rebuilding a jaw that maybe was crushed in trauma or removed for cancer, taking the lower abdomen and rebuilding a breast, taking the back muscle and rebuilding the soft tissues of the leg, and this went on and on and on and continues really to be our um, uh, kind of oracle, so to speak, of, of how we go about creating new opportunities to do auto, autologous transplantation. I think that the capstone has been manifest by some of our lead surgeons who are now doing um, composite allo transplantation of taking donor faces uh, Ed Rodriguez at the Institute of uh, Reconstructive Surgery at NYU most notably has done several extraordinary subtotal and total facial transplants in people who have massive trauma to the face, gunshot wounds, the like. And in this regard, you know, multiple components of different tissue types uh, using the principles of allotransplantation where we have to use immunosuppressives along with microvascular surgery. So it's been a wonderful evolution uh, in this regard. And many of those things we're bringing to Cedars uh, to actually integrate with our other great services. Yeah, I'd like to focus a little bit on a very important area of reconstruction, uh, which is breast reconstruction. And one of the great reasons uh, that we were felt so compelled to get you to come here to join us at Cedars-Sinai was what you just mentioned, the autologous reconstruction uh, of a breast from a patient's own tissue versus using a prosthetic device. And I wonder, I know that there's a balance in that some patients are better served by having the autologous reconstruction while others are better served by having a prosthesis. I wonder if you could just outline for our audience how that decision is made. Great question, slightly difficult uh, answer. Um, the most important thing to realize with breast reconstruction is that it is a quality of life intervention. Like very few of, uh, of many of our surgical procedures, this is something that will not lengthen the, the lifespan of, uh, of one of our victims of breast cancer by uh, an hour, a minute, a day. It, it really is something that is very private because in um, Western civilization, women don't bear their breasts to the public, uh, oftentimes not even to their uh, close intimate partners, especially after this type of interventional uh, uh, ablative surgery or when the breast is removed. So it, it, it's something that really means a lot to the patient as far as reparations paid by the giving, you know, the, the, the caring community, surgeons, the oncologists, to give back to a woman who's really been brutalized by the disease, number one, the intervention of the disease by mastectomy, by radiation therapy, by chemotherapy. So first and foremost, the, the patient, our women patients, must be seen as partners. So they have to be uh, educated as to each of the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of these operations, which there are many. Um, there are exquisite advantages to each of these, but they all come at a price. Um, women who are really uh, loath to have long, extensive surgical procedures uh, that, that are uh, cautious about prolonged recovery times, uh, and don't have a lot of body fat or a lot of donor sites um, and are minimal, minimalists in their, uh, in their thinking about these things are really going to do better with prosthetic devices. 
They need to know, however, that the, in the history of the device itself, uh, there will probably be several edits, uh, meaning interactions with a surgeon down the line because of uh, asymmetries, uh, discomfort, um, possible um, uh, leakage of an implant, uh, other slight mechanical problems that might occur. So that is, uh, is one line, which is the use of prosthetic devices, easy in, uh, not a lot of downtime in the front, but sometimes uh, interactive problems down the road. Uh, on the contrary, uh, or, or in contradistinction to that, would be the autologous reconstruction where a woman who's always desired to, let's say, get rid of extra abdominal fat uh, can undergo an operation which uh, really is quite sophisticated, harvest the lower abdominal tissues, with a blood vessel that supplies them. That blood vessel is attached using a very, very small hookup or anastomosis, which we call putting two blood vessels together uh, under the microscope, revascularizing that tissue and building a much more natural, much more long lasting breast reconstruction, uh, which might last a lifetime. It comes with a big scar on the abdomen. It comes with a longer operative time and really we have to be guided by our patients more so than in any other joint pursuit um, than, uh, than we might see in other specialties if we're really going to get the right outcome for that individual. Yeah, very thoughtful. And I, I know it's a complex uh, discussion that's held uh, every time. So you and I both have had the terrific uh, opportunity to, to be physicians for approaching 50 years. And uh, what would you say is going to be the, the single most important development in plastic surgery over the next decade, if you were to predict based on your previous experience? Well, I, I think that the most exciting things that we see coming out of our laboratories uh, is the idea of engineering tissue. So when we, we get to the point, and we, we've had some um successes though uh, uh, not really um, foundational but we've had some successes at growing cartilage um, at uh, at growing bone at at growing skin when we can fabricate uh, sophisticated components uh, of um, of parts of bodies that may not be uh, as amenable to transplantation like major organs uh, are. Uh, things like ears, noses, uh, things that are very, very uh, unique to individuals that are very sophisticated in their anatomic structure, but are not uh, isolatable to the point that they can be, nor should they be, transplanted with from, an, from a cadaver um, donor. Uh, if we can get to that point, which it, which I think we are doing, um, uh, and uh, and three D printing actually comes into play here, um, I think that when those devices can be fabricated such that they can be used surgically, that will be a um, a, a terrific lead into the future of plastic surgery. I think the other very important component is where we find our place, especially in the areas of extremity reconstruction, uh, where we find our place to be able to interface um, a human body to a smart prosthesis uh, and be able to understand how to use peripheral nerve reconstruction to motor uh, a lower or upper extremity prosthesis. I think that's going to be foundationally um, uh, change worthy and, uh, and will really add to uh, the horizon of our, our, our work. Yeah, well, that's, that is very exciting and, and uh, terrific uh, a vision for the future. So Randy, we very much appreciate your time and very much appreciate your here at Cedar sinai Thank you very much. My pleasure, thanks for having me.